Computer. All right. Well, today I have a very special guest um, on The Young Idealist, and we're going to venture into the work of um, Gotthold Ephraim Lessing. And today I have um, Hannes Kerber, um, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Harvard and an affiliate of the Center for American Political Studies. Um, uh, Hannes is also um, a lecturer in the philosophy department at the University of Munich and runs the academic lecture program. It's a para-academic institute called the Carl, Carl Frederick von Siemens Foundation. Um, Hannes has also studied 18th century philosophy and its reception of exiled German thought in the United States during the 1930s and 40s. Um, he's published a text on Gotthold Ephraim Lessing and modern biblical criticism, along with Hans Georg Gadamer, um, Nikolai Hartmann, and Leo Strauss. His book, which I have right here, which is fas fascinating and absolutely brilliant, I'm about halfway through it, um, Die Aufklärung der Aufklärung Lessing und die Herausforderung des Christentums. Hopefully I didn't butcher the title, I'm sorry. Not at all. I made it easy for you. I, <laughs> I tried to use <laughs> yeah. as few German words as possible. <laughs> Um, and it actually won the first Chetowelki Prize by the Interdisciplinary Center for European and Enlight Enlightenment Studies. So congratulations thank you. On, on all of this. And welcome to my channel. And thank you so much for being here. No, thank you, Chris, for having me. Um, so I have been venturing to get people interested in classical German philosophy and German idealism, and of course, German romanticism. And I've been doing these interviews with people because I think it's much better as opposed to just picking out a text and going through it. So I like the idea of going through someone's life and also their work yeah. and thought. So this is why I have you here today to help us, to guide us, navigate us um, through the life and thought of a um, of blessing. So maybe, maybe if you don't mind, you can maybe introduce us who Lessing was, maybe why he's important and his significance for us today. Sure. So um, introducing Gotthold Ephraim Lessing to, um, to the English speaking world, especially, is not all that easy because he is a household name in Germany. I mean, Lessing's role in shaping the Enlightenment and also in advocating for and also practicing racial, religious tolerance and sort of promoting the ideas of the Enlightenment more broadly has secured him a place like almost no other in the, um, in the, in the mind and memory of the German people until today. He's one of the key figures in the history of German literature, um, uh, philosophy and culture more broadly, I would say. He remains um, unusually famous, I would say. And along with such names as Goethe, Schiller, and Kant, his name rolls off German tongues pretty easily. Um, Lessing's work are, I would say, read very widely. It's almost obligatory reading in German high schools. Um, and his plays are also performed very, very widely um, on German stages right now, um, German speaking uh, stages right now, I should say. Last week at the Salzburg Festival, one of the major German language uh, cultural events, there was a new performance stage by, uh, um, of Nathan the Wise. And Nathan the Wise is maybe Lessing's most famous uh, play, which um, some American and Canadian uh, college students might have read in uh, classes um, because it is a pretty powerful plea uh, for tolerance. And another famous literary work um, by uh, Lessing is, is a play called Emilia Galotti, which critiques autocratic um, princely power. Um, so... He is um, one of the almost unequivocal good guys in the German, uh, in the history of uh, German uh, philosophy and uh, German, uh, the history of German ideas more broadly. And um, 
he's a very fascinating uh, uh, figure and um, uh, I'm truly excited to talk about him today because my uh, one of my books uh, was on Lessing and he's sort of the core of my interest. He's, he's very close to my heart, as you can probably tell. Well, thank you for that. Yes, and um, <clears throat> I have been getting kind of acquainted to him through your book um, and also understanding, you know, his his relation to the Enlightenment, yeah. his relation to tolerance um, and, and the scandal around uh, Nathan the Wise, which yes. I found interesting. Maybe we could um, speak about his life. Yeah, sure. I mean, speaking about his life might seem for some... Um, philosophers such as yourself and myself um, as a bit of a distraction. But actually Lessing's life was what received a lot of attention. So in the um, since we're talking um, broadly uh, uh, about the history of idealism, German idealism, in the Tübinger Stift, the um, high school in which a lot of the major German uh, idealists were educated, Lessing was sort of a secret code name, and that referred less to specific, um, less to specific uh, dogmatic or philosophical positions, and more to his way of life, a certain style of critique, um, uh, an independence of mind, and um, a kind of uh, yeah, sort of a, a, a kind of freedom in navigating uh, history and 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 critiquing. Uh, those in power. So let me give you um, a very rough outline of Lessing's life. Lessing was born in 1729 and died in 1781. So he's a couple of, or more than a couple, he's four or five years younger than Kant and died just a few weeks before Kant published the critique, the first critique, the critique of pure reason. Um, Lessing, Lessing's life was... Um, extremely eventful. Um, he was a real man about town. Um, he was a passionate drinker uh, and an equally passionate gambler. Um, and there's a whole book uh, entitled Lessing's Fluchten, Lessing's Escapes, devoted to uh, his life on the run. So he was constantly on the run, on the run away from an overbearing father, from financial debts, uh, from... Uh, philosophical controversies at times, as you've alluded to, and especially in his early years, um, a runaway from his himself, um, I would say. Um, the single most significant fact in Lessing's biography is, however, one that has very little to do with external facts, um, um, but more with his inner life. Um, because there is a radical reorientation in his self-understanding that occurred at some point in the late 1760s. So when he was no longer a very young man, um, but somewhere between sort of in his late 30s, I would say. I have to be a little imprecise because Lessing does not um, record this break in his life, this reorientation as it happens. Um, but documents after the fact, retrospectively, very clearly that it did happen. And the clearest acknowledgement um, of this break and reorientation can be found in a letter um, to Moses Mendelssohn written on January 9th, 1771. So among Lessing scholars, this is a very famous letter. So I I know it almost by heart, but I, um, I have the... Um, the proper um, proper quotation here. So, quote, indeed, my concern, this is Lessing writing to Mendelssohn in 71, indeed, my concern more than one day old is that while I'm throwing away certain prejudices, this is a description of the process of enlightenment, right? Throwing away prejudices. Prejudice is, is one of the watchwords in enlightenment discourse. While throwing away certain prejudices, I threw away along with them a little too much, which I have to recover. If I have not already started to do so, it is because I was hindered by the fear of dragging back into the house all the garbage. 
It is infinite. It is infinitely difficult to know when and where to stop. And for more than one, reflection ends when they get tired of reflection. So what Lessing describes here is how enlightenment has affected him personally. And I think this sort of really encapsulates that break in the late 1760s. And the nature of that break, of course, doesn't fully emerge um, from the quotation I just read, um, that sort of some of the prejudices that he had thrown away while being a very prominent Enlightenment thinker in the times before, sort of in the 1750s and 1760s, um, he, he fears that he has thrown away a little bit too much. And the period after this break, so the 10 odd years, um, the last 10 odd years of his life, there is a noticeable change in his attitude toward um, sort of rank and file enlightenment. So in the 1770s, especially, um, Lessing changes his attitude. And to set the stage a little bit, let me again, very broadly speak about what he, what his life looked like in the 1750s and 1760s, at least mostly. So he lived in Leipzig and Berlin, which were the centers of German enlightenment. German enlightenment was, is a little bit different from French or Scottish, from the French or Scottish enlightenments, and certainly very different from the North American enlightenments, um, in that it wasn't quite as radical. It was sort of a lot of the people were not, well, a lot of the people presented themselves as Christians. Um, it was um, a strong belief in progress, in pedagogy, and in secular, secular as well as rational politics, I would say. Um, Lessing, was certainly part of that of those circles and participated in the uh, in some of the most in, in some of the most important um, German Enlightenment projects of the time. So maybe the pinnacle of that is his engagement in the 1760s with a national theater in Hamburg. So Germany, of course, was not a united uh, nation in the sense of a united national state in the sense that France or the UK were in many ways united, but it was a latecomer, a little bit like Italy. And it was a lot of smaller principalities and it did not have, um, I'm talking a lot, you you will have to stop me at some point. Um, uh, so um, it, it didn't have a, 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 a a national public sphere and certainly not a national theater. And that's very much what Lessing the early Lessing, the pre-break Lessing tried to um, establish. Um, later on, after that break, after the letter to Moses Mendelssohn um, from 1771 onwards, Lessing withdrew in many ways from the um, Enlightenment circles. So he moved to Wolfenbüttel, which is a town that um, very few of us have heard of. And were it not for Lessing and his one of his predecessors, uh, Leibniz, uh, who also was a librarian in Wolfenbüttel, um, we would not have heard of this town. Um, uh, sort of, they they stop uh, selling beer at nine p.m. So it's it's a, it's a very small, very small um, uh, German town, and he moved there and really changed his. Um, Change, and his attitude towards the, the the German Enlightenment more broadly changed. And I think it's most visible in um, an intense investigation of the role of religion and theology more broadly, um, which manifested itself, and you've alluded to that previously, in the so-called fragments controversy. So I think this break is, is something we have to understand in order to approach Lessing, and it is sort of the single most important biographical fact, I would say. Um, second to that is something that I've already reached, um, um, and that is his friendship with Moses Mendelssohn. 
So uh, Lessig's, Lessing's friendship with Moses Mendelssohn is a unique friendship in um, the German speaking world. And that's partly because it was the friendship um, between a Jew and a Christian. So um, it's, it's, it's not entirely fair to uh, Moses Mendelssohn to reduce him uh, to being a Jew. And it's not entirely fair to uh, Lessing to reduce him to being a Christian. But their friendship is something that is absolutely unique. So um, in the seven, in the uh, 1960s, Gershom Scholem, the, the great historian of the Kabbalah and, the, um, and, and Jewish history um, and theology, said that a friendship, a true genuine friendship between Germans and um, Jews is impossible. And he made it very clear that this statement, which is a very controversial statement, and I don't think holds up in every respect, but um, is an important corrective uh, uh, statement or um, an important alert. Um, this uh, statement explicitly excludes Lessing and Mendelssohn. And Lessing and Mendelssohn um, met early on, um, just after Lessing had published a play called The Jews, in which he had a Jewish hero, which was very um, controversial at the time, caused a controversy, so literally controversial. And um, they formed a wonderful working relationship, um, collaboratively philosophized. So the romantics later called this Zimphilosophien, which uh, you're, of course, very familiar with. Um, they wrote a book together, um, Pope, referring to Alexander Pope, Pope and Metaphysician, Pope and Metaphysica, um, critiquing the French Enlightenment thinkers, especially, and the uh, Berlin Royal Academy of Sciences, and um, sort of aiming at, at French philosophes such as Voltaire. And they also collaborated together with another important um, German Enlightenment thinker, Friedrich Nicolai, on a set of letters that were posthumously published together called uh, Letters Concerning Tragedy. And um, Prefects über das Trauerspiel. And this friendship um, sort of went through different phases, but lasted throughout their lives and is another sort of another important um, biographical fact about about Lessing's life. And I, I know that you had Dustin Atlas on uh, on your channel um, last week, a few weeks ago, um, with a fascinating conversation about Mendelssohn and sort of that these two minds met at the same time is one of the, uh, one of the wonderful aspects of the history of German enlightenment. Um, that was fantastic. You <laughs> never have to apologize for talking too much. Everyone does that. <laughs> This the, everyone's here to listen to you, not to me. So that's great. I wanted to bring up something interesting um, when you were talking about um, uh, Lessing's relation to religious thought. Um, yeah, it seemed as though he he did he disliked the concept of revelation. He wanted to kind of he wanted to is that is that a fair critique that he wanted a, a more kind of a a kind of rationalized Christianity hmm. or or is that a you know I'm not a yeah. I'm not very well versed with Lessing, but um so i would say that the young lessing um this would certainly apply to the young lessing so there's um a short text he wrote as a very young man called um christentum der vernunft christianity of reason which belongs to which is one example of that almost genre of philosophic 18th century um, writings um, about a reasonable Christianity. Uh, so um, one of the favorite ideas of almost all in, uh, 18th century thinkers is that a religion, a, a religion that is based on revelation could be turned into something like a 
reasonable religion or a religion of reason, a religion which doesn't include exclude people um, who were not born at a certain point in time in order to um, uh, experience uh, this revelation and doesn't exclude people who were born to other traditions, right? But is um, universal in the sense that all reasonable people that also excluded a fair bit of people, but that was a different uh, uh, type of exclusion. So all reasonable human agents um, were able to participate in that religion. Um, this is often called natural religion. And Lessing has sort of a Christian natural religion in his early years. This, I think, is part of what changed during his reorientation in the late 1760s or early 1770s. So um, during the Fragments controversy, what he's investigating first and foremost is a robust understanding of revelation. And um, in Nathan the Wise, I think that's very much at issue. And the the play culminates in a, the famous parable of the three rings or parable of the rings um which does not preach a rational or natural religion and the education of the human race another text we will certainly talk about later on and um, because Schelling um was uh, was deeply influenced um, by it um, you said uh, in before we started recording, you said that today is about Lessing, but I wanted to bring up Schelling at least once. <laughs> um, um, in the education of the human race, um, Lessing investigates somewhat playfully and ironically the notion of revelation in light of the notion of education, pedagogy. Um, so there are certainly attempts to critique what his contemporaries understood by revelation, but I think it's not based on a dislike of the idea, or um, but on the sense that his contemporaries were not serious enough in thinking through the concept. So I would say that especially after that break, so in the time of the 1770s and early 1780s, um, Lessing's project can in some sense be described as a recovery of the genuine sense of revelation. And this recovery, I would say, is for him not a religious task. It can be a religious task, right? But it is a philosophical task. So for him, and this is something that sort of sets the agenda for um, quite a bit of German idealism and classical German uh, uh, philosophy, um, for him, the confrontation of reason and revelation, Christianity and enlightenment um, is something that we need to understand first and foremost by understanding revelation and Christianity. And that sort of reason, uh, the self-understanding of reason benefits from our study of religion and especially of Christianity. But Lessing doesn't limit his, uh, that's just a footnote to my last sentence. Lessing doesn't limit his interest in uh, the positive religions. So the the um, the historical phenomena, um, uh, the historical those religions that existed, um, that really existed in history, he doesn't uh, limit that to Christianity. He's deeply into, interested in Judaism. So Nathan the Wise also has a Jewish hero. And um, his interest in Islam is unprecedented. There have been a few books about that. And that's not my um, oh, field of expertise, but he's um, he has a deep interest in, in Islam and Muslim theology. And um, yeah, that's a, that's a fascinating aspect. And it shows, yeah, he's in some respects, Hegel was called Lessing's Vertrauter, so a good friend of Lessing. 
and I think that is in in many respects true to the very end. So Lessing's uh, Lessing's interest in religion and Hegel's interest in religion are very similar in that respect. That's fascinating. Actually, now you've tempted me. So now we now we should move to his thought because now yeah. I'm getting a little excited. This is, but something just before we move to that, something I found interesting is. Um, in his work in in writing theater and in, in writing these, yeah. these plays, he seemed at one point to move away from the French kind of Parisian um, role of of uh, I guess yeah. literature and, and 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 their theater and move closer to like um, a reading of like Aristotle's Poetics and maybe the kind yes. of old Greek style of theater yeah. in a sense. I found that fascinating actually that he. You know, especially some from someone from the Enlightenment, but also yeah. seeing, okay, no, 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 we need to, there needs to be a structure, there needs to be yes. some sort of, some form of poesy, some kind of poetic nature to it. I found that fascinating. Yeah. So I think that is, that is an important, um, if somewhat late addition to my uh, early introduction to uh, Lessing. Lessing is not just a philosopher and not just a poet. He's also an art critic. Uh, so in the 1750s what and, and 1760s, what he wrote first and foremost are an incredible number of reviews uh, um, uh, of literature and art criticism. He, he really was deeply involved in shaping aesthetics before that philosophic field had its name. So he's also an art critic and a poet. And in both respects, he wanted, as you said, to break away from the French model. So France was in almost all cultural and um, intellectual respects, the model country of Europe. And those who sort of broke away from that, like the Scottish Enlightenment famously, or the French Enlightenment did so by criticizing um, the French, um, so the French are a little bit of the, they're more or less the intellectual punching bag of the 18th century. Um, and by returning to the ancients, to um, Greek and Roman antiquity. And Lessing um, in 1766 uh, wrote a book called Laocon. That's a, um, uh, that is his major contribution to the philosophy. Philo philosophy of art and uh, aesthetics. Um, it has been called the first extended attempt to distinguish the spheres of visual art on the one hand and of literary art in modern times. Um, so the Laocon is broadly speaking an act of critique in the sense of distinguishing two spheres. Um, so Lessing wants to bring out the essential differences, I would say, between visual arts. So what he's thinking about first and foremost are painting and sculpturing and literary arts. And what he's thinking of first and foremost here is poetry. Um, so you might wonder what this rather strange, I mean, some you don't, but some of our viewers might wonder what the strange title Laocon is supposed to um, indicate. And this title refers to one of the most famous artworks that has survived from antiquity. It's the Laocon group, which is today, today still visible in, um, in the Vatican museums in Rome. And the Laocon group was discovered in 15, um, 1506, in January of 1506. So a lot of things happening in Januarys. <laughs> um, and, uh, and this group blew the minds of artists, art historians, art critics, and philosophers. And, um, and was the, there's a real debate a close-knit debate in, in uh, Germany in the 18th century going on, which involved Goethe, Schopenhauer, um, Lessing, and um, a, a, a famous art historian called Winkelmann. And the, I said that, uh, I'll explain in a minute how the Laocon group fits into Lessing's argument, but to 
sketch out the argument um, at least a little bit. As I said, the um, Laocon is an act of distinction. It's, it's the attempt to distinguish poetry from painting and, and sculpturing, from the visual arts. And Lessing does this in an ingenious way. He invents, but doesn't use himself, uh, the notion of the artistic medium. So what does this mean? According to Lessing, art and poetry come into their own by virtue of their media. So this, as Lessing would say, the signs that they use to depict their subjects. And while poetry uses articulated sounds in time, as he says, so words and sentences, what we do right now, art and Lessing would argue not just painting and sculpturing, but all visual arts uses figures and colors in space. And these different media um, form the nature of these respective arts and their differences. And there's one sort of crucial sentence, which every Lessing scholar should know by heart, and that is that the sign, so this me artistic medium, either sounds in time or figures and colors in space, um, this uh, these signs must bear an indisputable, indisputably suitable relation to the thing signified. Um, so that what what does that mean? <laughs> that's 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 a simple sentence in some respects, but it's pretty abstract. And Lessing shows the um, the significance of that claim by reinterpreting the Laocon group, um, this sculpture which we to this day can find in the Vatican museums, and you should all all. All of, all of our viewers who haven't seen it should look at it. It's a it's an absolutely fascinating sculpture and one that definitely merits its own video. Uh, you should you should do one because there's such a fascinating debate um, post, surrounding it. With the video, I'll post a, a picture of that. Lady Okun. That would be wonderful. Yes, yes, that's a that's a great idea. Yes. Um, so. Um, since it was found, his um, art critics artists and historians have wondered why does this Laocon depicted here not scream and cry out? So we see him depicted with his two sons, one of whom has just been killed and the other one is about to be killed by two gi giant sea serpents and one of the sea serpents just bit Laocon into his lower hip and we can see that his body um, is 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 moved by the pain, but his face is perfectly calm, and there's a there's a long going a long and complicated debate that we can really get into right now on this question: Why does this man not scream? Um, so one suggestion was um, the Greeks are just better human beings than we are. They're stronger, they're more powerful, they're more courageous. They don't cry when they get bitten. They don't cry when they face face death. Um, that was not Lessing's uh, response. Um, so uh, Lessing, um, Lessing explained the fact that Laocon does not cry in the Vatican group a fact that, by the way, is underlined by the fact that the most famous literary depiction of Laocon, which is to be found in Virgil's Aeneid, um, in this literary depiction of Laocon, Laocon um, cries um, and screams like a wounded bull. So he, um, this just underlines the question why does, on the one hand, Laocon in poetry scream, but in art, in sort of this masterpiece that has survived from antiquity, why does he seem to 
um, take all this pain and mental suffering with so much more calm, calmness. And Lessing's response is not one that sort of focuses on the anthropological differences that supposedly exist between ancients and moderns, but he explains this by the virtue, by, by looking at the media that the two, um, that poetry on the one hand and visual arts on the other use. So he says that since, um, since visual arts aim for beauty, the artist has to select the pre what he calls the pregnant moment um, to show an action, not in its development, but in sort of its pregnant moment where you can see it unfolding in your mind. And this has to be a moment which encaps encapsulates beauty. And this couldn't, this just couldn't be, it would be an impossibility, according to Lessing, for this art, for this medium, for visual art as such, to depict Laocon with his mouth torn open and sort of a, a face um, deformed by pain. So the artist picked the pregnant moment, which was the moment right before Laocon started to scream. And this is why the book is called Laocon. So uh, Lessing, as an art critic, as a philosopher of art, um, as you said, uh, goes back to the Greeks and really develops um, a thought that is crucial for modern aesthetics, namely that art and medium, the artistic medium, um, go together very intimately. That's brilliant. Actually, it, it kind of foregrounds something that that you know, art in its that philosophical art is doing right now. I, you know, when you yeah. were talking, I was thinking of uh, Francis Bacon's Popes, his famous yes. Popes, the Scream, and and what you have is you have a a, a mad Pope in a geometrical shape. Um, Bacon always would put his his human meat, as he called them, in in geometrical shapes and blur the face. But the thing that's that's almost odd about it is. The figure is very, very straightforward. And we're meant, we're meant to feel the affect of the scream. We're meant to hear the scream in yeah. our head and see just just from the, the opening of the mouth. So yeah. the way that you described that was perfect and, and very Thank beautiful. You. Thank and, you, and very modern. And I don't understand why people are not, you know, flocking to lessing here about this. This <laughs> just is ingenious, actually. Yeah, I mean, um, this is a good moment to speak about some of the problems. I mean, the Laocon, for example, is not translated very well. It that sh I mean, a, a new translation is is necessary, I think. Um, and it's also, if I mean, if I if I should have tempted you to read the book, I very much recommend reading it. But on the other hand, it's also it shows a wonderful literary madness it's not um it's not a treatise you know it's it doesn't read in any way like kant it reads a little a little bit like leibniz it's it's back and forth it's very dramatic it's a it's a literary it's a literary um, presentation so um lessing also invents the story that halfway through the book he had discovered another book by winkelmann which enraged him and which he sort of had to deal with all of a sudden so there's a there's a theatricality to the presentation of the argument which is a lot of fun to read but irritates us as students of philosophy because i think as students of philosophy today we're so used to a systematic presentation um which originates only with kant really and it's if I don't have to tell you as a student of, of Schelling, you know very well that sort of there are different literary forms in which philosophy can be presented. But I think one thing that we right now re have relearn as a discipline as we speak is recognizing philosophy that is presented in different forms um, than we're used to. 
and this opens up and it blows open so many doors. I mean, it, it, it all of a sudden, I have a friend who's working on female philosophers in the 19th century who use uh, diaries and interviews as their um, form. And that is just, I mean, I'm, I have to admit, that's just not where I would have looked uh, for philosophy, you know, because we are so prejudiced um, in, uh, in the way we approach philosophical texts. And I think that's partly why Lessing often fell off the wagon. Um, his, his texts sometimes don't look like philosophy. Um, but in the case of the Laocondes, I would say no question whatsoever. I mean, no, uh, no one who's interested in the philosophy of art of the 18th century. And I would also say, as you say, this, this claim sounds very modern. It is very modern. Um, uh, no one can ignore that. But it is a little bit of interpretive work. I would say it's fun. That's the reason why I worked on on Lessing. It's um, when, when the best advice I've ever received was um, when I was trying to choose a topic for a dissertation. One of my professors in Chicago said, um, "You should choose that topic very wisely. It shouldn't it shouldn't ever bore you. It should be someone who writes beautifully." And you should like that topic because it will stay with you for a long time. And it does. It really does. Like I'm, I'm, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I won't be able to get rid of Lessing for a long time. And I'm, I'm happy about that. This is, see, this is, <clears throat> sorry to bring up Schelling here. This is how I feel about Schelling because the first time I read Novalis and yeah. Novalis's Ficta studies, which are fragments, I wasn't, I wasn't attuned to how he wrote, you know, yeah. with Nietzsche, you, you, you get used to the aphorism, the, the yes. poignantness of his aphorism. But um, with, with Novalis, I had to really work at it, but Schelling really blew me away because he writes poetically and he yes. writes very densely, but poetically. And I had to get used to that. And a, and a friend of mine named Jason Wirth, has called the ages of the world, the Welt Elter, a, a cosmic poem, and it really is kind of that. So I really, this is very, we're we're on we're on mutual ground here, very much so. So fascinating, awesome. Yeah, no, I am I, I I I'm 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 happy. Yeah, I I think like this is also a, like a very promising um, moment in time. I think we really um, right now are in the process of rediscovering the connections of writing and thinking and of literature and um, philosophy. And I hope that is good news for Lessig scholarship. <laughs> no, I think it, I think it is. I think it is. So we, we've talked about the, the Lao Kun uh, yeah. a little bit. Maybe we could move to the, the fragments controversy yeah. yes. um, with Nathan but, Wise. This is an yeah. exciting controversy actually. Yes. Um, uh, yes, you're absolutely right. And that is another good example. I think the, the transition will go, be smoothly because uh, the fragments controversy is a really bitter public controversy. Um, and again, I think some of us are not used to uh, seeing philosophers at war, um, not literally, but at sort of war of letters. And um if you study people like Fichte or Lessing, you really have to get used to um, combative philosophy and combative language. Yeah, I mean, Fichte, and of... Fichte and Schelling back and forth are hilarious. You know, <laughs> my friend, you're you're on the, you're on the right path, but follow me, follow me. I have the right system. No, 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 no. Back and forth. That's hilarious. Yeah. So um, the fragments controversy um, was started by Lessing, and I I think started very 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 consciously. So when he came to Wolfenbüttel at the beginning of the seventeen seventies, he said um, he wrote to a friend, "I have planned some, I have mischievous plans," and um, a few years later he starts to publish. Um, seven texts in dramatic order, uh, so they they escalate over time, 
Um, and these te seven texts contain the most drastic critique of relig religion that the German public had ever seen. And I would argue that the European public as such had ever seen. There have been, there is like a clandestine radical enlightenment, which um, had been similarly drastic in some aspects before that, but that has been the radical enlightenment is so difficult to detect and only was dif discovered really only recently or rediscovered only recently by um, historians in the last few decades because it is sort of well under the attention, under the threshold of attention of the public. And Lessing released these seven fragments um to the public and they were read immediately by the entire um, German reading public, right? This is a fraction of the German um, population at the time, um, but it was, they were, these fragments were read very widely. And the, the drastic nature of these seven fragments is hard to overstate. So the way I put it um, in class is I say, this is Spinoza on steroids. Um, Lessing, Lessing um, edits these fragments. He presents himself as the editor. And we know now uh, for a fact that he was only the editor and presents them as fragments by an unnamed author. And this unnamed author is really a radical Spinozist and has no... Spinoza is careful in the way he writes. I mean, his motto on his ring was Kaute. So um, he was he was famously careful in the way he uh, wrote, um, but was seen as an extremely controversial atheist in the 18th century. Um, this this the author of the uh, of the fragments um, holds no punches whatsoever. Um, we know now people learn pretty soon it's an open secret it's the, an open secret in the late 18th century that the author is a guy called Hermann um, uh, Samuel Reimarus and Reimarus um, makes this even more problematic because Reimarus was a pretty famous at least well-established gymnasium teacher so he was a high school teacher but that undersells him a little bit so he was in H hamburg there was no university so the gymnasium was really um an academic prep school maybe a college um of uh, and he was had a good reputation kant admired his logic and he also uh, wrote one of uh, the texts that we spoke about earlier like um um a religion of reason a defense of something that looked very much like Christianity, but wasn't quite Christianity. So people had assumed that Reimarus was a, a, a believer and was one of the um, tr defenders of Christian philosophical defenders of Christianity in the 18th century. Even his wife thought that. But in night hours, during the night, he wrote a 3,000 page manuscript going through the bible and cri cri criticize like biblical criticizing like criticizing the bible with the means of biblical criticism that spinoza had originated in many respects and presenting a thoroughgoing um uh, critique of the bible that left sort of that left the bible in shambles according to his own presentation so what Lessing did was not publish the whole book. 3,000 pages would have been hard to take in for the public, but he took out fragments or presented them as fragments, took out short texts and presented them as fragments and released them to the public and unsurprisingly uh, caused a real outburst of criticism. Um, so dozens of clergymen and um, theologians and schoolmen uh, quickly rose to the occasion and wrote hundreds and hundreds of um, responses to these fragments, 
uh, defending the Bible and biblical religion, especially Christianity, of course, against the attacks of the so-called unnamed author. Um, and the reviews that appeared in all European languages at the time number in the thousands. Um, a, a, a friend of mine, uh, Jonathan Fine at Brown, um, has written a dissertation that I'm trying to push him to publish uh, that lays this out in fantastic detail and um, and shows the real shows the how how wide how far and wide the controversy surrounding the fragments was and the fragments controversy and I think this is an important point to take home is one of the if not the most important intellectual controversy in the 18th century um all of the thinkers um that will be discussed on your channel have really taken this to heart so Schelling Hegel Kant and so on and so forth ha that was part of their religious education if we want to speak in that way and um so the controversy started and Lessing who had previously been assumed to be on the same page as the unnamed author uh, took a very surprising step because he didn't defend um, the unnamed author's philosophical positions, but said that he had published them. He had published this um most, as he calls it, most massive attack on Christianity because he wants a defender to step up, a defender of Christianity to step up to the plate and um, defend Christianity in the way that it deserves. So Christianity, according to Lessing, had been attacked in the most explicit, most outspoken way, and now Lessing calls for a defense. And this might, to many of us, sound like rhetoric and like an, an excuse to to uh, to publish radical fragments. I mean, after all, there was sens serious censorship in um, the Holy Roman Empire, as Kant would later learn, um, uh, and as Schelling certainly knew. Um, um, and uh, so Lessing claims, at least, that he wants a response from the theologians to this philosophical attack. And when none of the theologians of his time st step up to the plate, Lessing himself articulates a defense of Christianity against this critique that as such, and that's why my book, you kindly showed it, that's why I called my book the Enlightenment of the Enlightenment that contains a real critique of the Enlightenment in the sense of this tradition that spans from Spinoza through Hobbes to this unnamed author, the Raimaros we talked about earlier, and that criticized um, Christianity and revealed religion more broadly um, by examining the Bible with the means of biblical criticism, so in a historical way. And Lessing articulates, Lessing's shorthand formula for this, taken from Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul, um, uh, uh, excuse me, from St. Saint, Saint Paul, from um, uh, um, is, this is an attack on the letter, but the letter needs to be distinguished from the spirit, and an attack on the letter, in brackets, the Bible, is not as such a critique of the spirit, in brackets, religion. Because the spirit, faith in the spirit, needs to be based in faith itself and not in another authority. So we could now go on a long theological um uh, uh, investigation of what this means um, and whether this is an adequate um, defense of Christianity or an attempt 
and that is what some people have argued, an attempt to defend Christianity while stabbing it in the back. Um, an investigation of this kind I, I, I have tried to do in my book, but I think that would sort of go into a lot of details, um, interesting theological details, but I'm I'm not sure everyone would be interested and there would be no chance that we would get to the end of this uh, video today. So let me fast forward really quickly to the very end. So um, Lessing's distinction between letter and spirit is criticized by the um, most prominent Lutheran theologians of his time as baseless, and in response, he says, you Lutherans, you contemporary Lutherans don't understand Luther and don't understand your own tradition because you're, you're the fathers of modern Protestantism understood that this distinction is so is, is necessary and is based in what Lessing calls with the tradition, the inner testimony of the Holy Spirit. And this inner testimony of the Holy Spirit is a complicated but very interesting um, foundational doctrine of theology. Lessing argues that you can find it both in Protestant and in Catholic theologies. And it more or less means that faith in God must be based on the self-attestation of God. So it cannot be based in any other authority than God himself. Um, that, again, is a there, there's much to be said about this from a logical point of view. That is, of course, an almost question-begging argument. Um, but from a, theolo from a theological point of view, that is an argument that I think can be defended. And I've argued can be defended theologically um, as a problematic uh, attitude as a problematic uh, argument um and um none i mean the surprising fact in the controversy is that none of the theologians at the time say well of course now we know what you're talking about um um but they uh, still refuse to acknowledge um that lessing has shown a theologically very interesting um, and uh, foundational aspect in his debate and has in a way really defended Christianity or as he would put it, biblical religion against this onslaught by the unnamed author. Um, so it is a very complex but truly interesting um, debate. And unfortunately, it's cut short by the um, by the reintroduction of censorship, so Lessing wrote um, without censorship for a while. That was a unique position because he was in a very liberal principality, um, close to Braunschweig, um, and censorship was uh, reintroduced, and he uh, was not allowed to write about religion at all. Um. This caused him to um, change genre, so to speak, and he wrote Nathan the Wise. Um, Nathan the Wise is very clearly part of, um, part and maybe the culmination of the Fragments controversy, but at the same time, it, it is also a fun play that anyone who gets a chance should watch. And um, soon, I hope next year, maybe, um, the English-speaking world will be able to uh, read a new translation because uh, together with a colleague of mine, Martin Yaffe, I'm working on, on such a translation. And um, we hope to show, on the one hand, how Nathan the Wise is a literary masterpiece and... Um, should can be read on its own and if if read on its own it is a very interesting defense of tolerance I've, as i've mentioned at the beginning of our conversation and um it is a tolerance not of pity that is the type of tolerance that we often find in the 18th century sorry to interrupt you for a second 
when you and your colleague published yeah. this piece. I'd love to have both of you here and to promote the publication. So we that will be yeah we, we that will be wonderful. We, we can have both of you on here and discuss the piece and get more more yeah. attention to the publication because I this is why I have this channel. I think all of this thought should be out in the open and that people should be discussing these ideas. So please that that that's fantastic and congratulations on that. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you on that. No 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 no. It, 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 it's good that you've inter. I know. Thank you so much for that opportunity. Yes, we should discuss Nathan the Wise. I'm 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 sure you would have so many things to contribute. And um, yes, let's let, let's plan on that. Um, so as I said, Nathan the Wise is this plea for tolerance, and it's a powerful plea for tolerance because it is not a tolerance of pity. So this is a bit formulaic, but I think it's helpful. But it's a tolerance of respect, and um, it ha it has been throughout the two hundred and almost 50 250 years that Nathan the Wise um was put on 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 um the stage it has had an effect at some points um in time so uh, after 911 there was a there was a very prominent um performance in New York City and uh, during the second world war there was a powerful another powerful performance in in also in New York City by the uh, Jewish exile community um, put on stage by Evin Piscato, one of the truly fascinating uh, theater uh, people who ha had to flee Hitler. And uh, the poster they put up all over New York said, um, fight uh, Hitlerism, fight intolerance, fight hoodlumism, read Nathan the Wise. And uh, I think on the one hand, that is a, optimistic <laughs> you know um but it also shows that nathan the wise is today one of the texts which help enlightenment scholars and especially german the german public to reevaluate and test the presuppositions of the enlightenment and to test the kind of tolerance um that um the Enlightenment calls for. And Nathan the Wise is um, a great piece. And now knowing that we will talk about it, I will um, not say all that much, but let me let me add one more, at least one more thing. Um, and that is that it is not only a literary masterpiece and one that has a political message that many of us can get on board with or should be able to get on board with, hopefully, um, but it's also philosophical. Um, in my in my view, it's also a philosophical masterpiece. So, because the fragments controversy ended somewhat suddenly, and from Lessing's point of view, somewhat unsatisfactory, since the um, theologians who engaged him in this controversy, in his view, theologically did not step up to the plate. Um, he continued this controversy by putting on stage someone who experiences something akin. So Nathan the Wise, in one of the later scenes in the drama, in uh, scene 4-7, um, experiences something like this te inner testimony of the Holy Spirit. So he has an experience, a religious experience which shows this immediacy, and I would say philosophically shows the path to how we should investigate this. So my reading is that Lessing, because he realized that the theologians would not do what he had hoped they would do in, um, in, the, in the Fragments controversy, turned to literature not just because he had to avoid censorship, but also turned to literature in order to continue his philosophical investigation. And that, again, I think makes him, shows how modern he is, how modern in the sense of the 19th century, maybe. Um, uh, and um, yeah, so I, I think Nathan the Wise is very much um, worth looking at. And I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that we'll talk about it.
um, hopefully next year. <laughs> that's that's great. Um, I know I've been I've been throwing so much questions at you. So yes, no, okay. shoot. Um, I was wondering if we could maybe go over the education of the human race. Yeah. Is this yeah. when I was looking up about this text, I saw that it, it it's technically called like a one of the first treatises of humanity or something like that. And that that's that really kind of fascinated me. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if yeah. we could maybe talk about some of the themes from it or some of the yeah. ideas and concepts. Yeah. Yeah. Um so the education of the human race, um and the German title is slightly less race, as you can imagine, it's not a word very often used in contemporary German. Geschlecht, right? It can, yes, it's it's man it's something like mankind. Um yeah, so it's um the Erziehung des Menschengeschlechts. The education of the human race is a text based on an analogy. The analogy is um or the question that the text asks is how does under our understanding of revelation change or improve if we see revelation um as the equivalent to education so if we see revelation as the equivalent to the human race um of so so if we assume that revelation is for the human race, what education is um, for the individual. So that's the that's the analogy he he uses, right? Education, revelation. So when you said earlier um, that Lessing dislikes um, or seems to dislike the notion of revelation, for for a brief moment, I wanted to say, well, he wrote a book about that, <laughs> um, because the education of the human race is sort of an analogy of revelation, right? But on the other hand, the story is much more complicated. So uh, the education of the human race is a text that Lessing also presents himself as the editor of. Here, we're 99% certain that he wrote the text himself. So in my mind, there's no doubt that he's the author. Um, so he physically wrote the manuscript of uh, the education of the human race. But he doesn't um, make the thoughts or even the text as such his own. Um, so he doesn't present himself as the author, but says there is an author and presents himself as the editor, writes an editorial preface and also in his private correspondence, never acknowledges that he himself is the author of um, the text, but says that the author, um, uh, that the author is a friend who likes to think through ideas and then throw them away. <laughs> so um, the text, the education of the Human race starts with something like a natural revelation, so a revelation to all men, um, that reason in its infancy was not able to accept or retain. And this is the moment when history, with a capital H, starts, because God chooses one nation, the people of Israel, as his chosen people, and gives them a special revelation. Um, and this Judaism is, according to the education of the human race, the religion of the age of the child of human reason. So the text presents, because of the analogy between education and revelation, presents the development of the human race as, um, in light of the development of an individual. So the age um, age of the child is Judaism, and um, Judaism is an advance over um, infancy insofar as Judaism teaches morality or moral action um, insofar as that teaching is based on temporal rewards and punishments. Um, only Christianity, according to the education of the human race, 
is um, and Christianity is, of course, the religion of the boyhood of the human race. Only Christianity taught morality with a view to the immortality of the soul. To put it differently, um, Christ, um, according to this text, recommended inner purity of heart with a view to another life. So whereas in boyhood, you should do good because if you don't, you will be punished. And if you do, you will be rewarded in this life um, uh, as, as, a, as, as a child. In adolescence, in Christianity, you will um, you have to do it with a view to the next life with a few to sort of you should have moral inner moral purity um uh with a view to the immortality of the soul in the next life um but lessing or the author of the education of the human uh, race makes it clear that christianity too has to be overcome because the religion to come the religion of the mature human race will enable human beings to do good because it is good. So the um, human race reaches its highest levels of enlightenment and purity, as Lessing puts it, only when the members of the human race do the good, the good thing, the moral action, because it is good and not because anything else. So he charges in a way um, Judaism and Christianity with borrowing arguments for moral actions from the future. So it's not do good done um, for itself, but it's good done for something else. Um, and this is the overarching theme of the education of the moral, uh, of the education of the human race, pardon me. And it's um, it shows this, pretty strong belief in human progress and also shows and is in some respects one of the founding documents of a philosophy of religion because it brings the development of reason and the um, historical process or history with a with an uppercase H into um, into correspondence in some respects there are um sort of fascinating details and it's again one of a uh, one of these texts where you could easily we could easily fill an hour or two um, by just discussing um this text but i guess one um sort of um well, i would be remiss if if we didn't talk briefly about one of the most philosophically most influential parts and that is um the education of the human race includes philosophical reconstructions of certain religious dogmas. So um, this is the dogma of or the original sin, the dogma of the Holy Trinity, and the dogma of the son's satisfaction. And um, especially the um, dogma of the, the philosophical reconstruction of the Holy Trinity, which is in and of itself complicated, um, it's a it's a short paragraph. Everyone who wants to can read it. Um, uh, but it's a it's a complicated account. Um, and um, Lessing um, Lessing suggested that the um, this philosophical rearticulation of religious dogmas. The, as he says, the development of religious truths into rational truths is absolutely necessary. And this claim kickstarted, in some respects, the Sh Schelling's project, at least in my mind. You know, you can see this in his Magister dissertation on the origins of evil. And then um, also in the in the lectures on the method of um, academic studies, and most prominently in the freedom essay, where history has the goal in grasping itself 
in the historic uh, where history has the goal of reason grasping itself in the historical process and it does that partly by sort of developing religious truths necessarily into rational truths and i would love to hear um if if you agree with this or how this sort of plays out in shelling because this is to me, as someone who works on the earlier Enlightenment, still somewhat obscure, but I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Wow. Um, well, number one, those are brilliant, um, it's a brilliant summation of what you had there. Fantastic. It's true. Um, I've done I've done videos on Schelling's biography and, and his early earlier work, and we see him, you know, in this work, his very his very early kind of master's thesis in 1792 on good and evil um he brings in this whole idea of the fall this is the first time where he actually kind of relevantly brings up the the fall which then is brought back into his work on philosophy and religion yeah. and then and the and as he said at the freiheit shrift um i actually never knew i, I didn't know how much of an influence lessing mm. was on on that aspect, I actually thought maybe he, he, he was more of an uh, influence um, in his philosophy of art and mm -hmm. maybe his, maybe later on the philosophy of mythology, the way that he sees mythology as this kind of necessary component to um, cognition and history and kind of a, an overlapping of the two. Um, but yet, no, I agree with you on, um, on university studies as well as... Uh, in the in the freedom essay um for me the freedom essay is is um is a kind of developed um you know when Schelling goes to Bavaria in 1804 just like in Lessing he's silenced by the by the by the Württembergian um authorities they they silence him based on on his um He's kind of, you know, protecting Fichte. Fichte had been dismissed in 1799, um, and they weren't very happy with Bruno. Or, or so he, he had this, you know, this kind of silencing there, and he was working towards um, a a kind of liberal, like mm -hmm. a liberal um, education where one could, you know, uh, one could speak freely and think freely. And I yeah. think from from what we're talking about today. He gets this from Lessing as well. And as well as your point about history and reason, um, these are key points. Interestingly, Schelling has only, in his early work, brings up history once, and that's in the system of transcendental idealism. That's the three epochs. But the freedom essay, as you brought up, is the first where he really works in history along with reason, as you said. So I agree with you with oh. your with your account. Um, so th that's that's really fascinating. And now now you've tempted me to secretly write a paper on on uh, Schelling and Lessing. Now the influence. So you should so, you should not do it secretly. Uh, this would be a fantastic paper. Yes. No. No. That's what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> no. I, I I mean it is. I think that's partly it. It is very hard to trace Lessing's influence. I just um, last year reviewed a book um, by a prominent Austrian Kant scholar on the relationship of Kant and Lessing. And this Kant, I, is, tracking sources is a hard game. And it's a slightly dangerous game because sometimes great minds think alike. Sometimes they uh, they uh, grasp uh, similar thoughts um, independently. Um, sometimes they say the same thing but mean different things. So I think it's a it's a it's a it's a pretty dangerous game. And you um, parallels have the problem of never meeting, right? They they never touch, and um, that's why you sort of need to understand two thinkers um, very well before you can write that. Rudolf Langthaler, in his book on Kant and Lessing, sees Lessing everywhere in Kant, like at more at many more places than where I would see him, and um, cr sometimes critically, sometimes affirmatively. But it is very, I think, partly because Lessing did philosophy 
philosophized, presented his philosophy in such a different way, sometimes in more or less journalistic pieces, in controversial, in polemical writings. Um, he wasn't quoted in the same way. You know, he wasn't referred to as one of the um, people of the tradition. Um, he wasn't referred to in the way that people at the time might refer to Christian Wolf or Leibniz. Um, but we can safely assume that he was in the back of their minds, that he they had read his 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 that they had read many of his writings and were in some sort of dialogue with them so i would love to read your um your essay on on shelling and lessing because i think that is still under underexplored um um it it is it, yeah it, that is that is still an underexplored topic it's, at least it's, from our side of the it's funny because um the only time, the only real time these, these German thinkers um, cite people um, is in letters. This, yeah. is, this is my experience. Uh, Schelling, well, you know, Schelling, Fichte, um, you know, Jacobi, unless he's at an attack, it's right on an attack, will very, very, you know, vaguely bring up somebody or brush by them so it really is detective work that you're doing yeah. um and you know the other than other than Schelling's Burmian influence the Ungrund I yeah. mean you could really pick out from Jakob Burma or or things from Erdinger you know but when you were talking about Lessing and his approach you know I got themes of Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard's pseudonyms. Yes. Um, I got Schelling's earlier work and, yeah. and, and the later work of Revelation. Of course, Hegel, I got lots of things, lots of note, keynotes, kind of, you know, overlapping ideas. And so, and I also, you know, Kierkegaard was in, in the background, yeah. like just like pulsating when you're talking yeah. about the, the journal ideas and was he the editor, was he the, the, the author? Very, very yeah. interesting. You know, similar things happen with Kierkegaard where he he says that he's the editor and then writes a pseudonym yes. for <clears throat> the author. Very interesting. So yeah. I think now the discussion, maybe we can talk about the impact, reception, and yeah. influence of Lessing. Yeah. This would be a perfect part. To yes, I, I, I agree. Yeah, I am um, maybe a good transition to Kierkegaard or, um, well, at least sort of a, a, a necessary preparation for talking about Lessing's influence in any respect is talking about um, Jacobi, Friedrich Heinrich Jacobi, and, and the what is known in the English speaking world as the pantheism pantheism controversy, or and what what um, Germans typically refer to as the Spinoza controversy, um, because in the late in the last years of his life, um, Jacobi, who was at the time um, a little-known author of um, philosophically interesting, but that's that's as much as I'm willing to say, philosophically interesting novels. So it was really more of a, maybe a second-rate literary figure, pretty young at the time, um, was noticed by Lessing, and Lessing wrote him an appreciative uh, letter, and Jacobi then visited Lessing and later after Lessing's death in seven, so uh, Jacobi published this book in 1785, um, a book addressed explicitly uh, to Moses Mendelssohn, whom we've mentioned at the beginning of this conversation. He wrote a book called On the Teaching of Spinoza in Letters to Moses Mendelssohn. And this, um, this book which is fun to read, but again, one of these books that seems to have a beginning and an end that are marked first and foremost by two book covers and not really by an argument, by the beginning of an argument and the end of an argument. Um, this, um, this book begins with a real bombshell at the time. It begins with the claim that Lessing had in his conversation with Jacobi 
um, confessed that he was a Spinozist, so um, one of the adherents of the thought of Spinoza. And this was on a number of levels an important and controversial claim. Mendelssohn could not accept this for the life of his. And if when I say for the life of his, that's that's um, that's a that I don't want this to be taken as a cruel joke. But he died in his controversy with Jacobi, and some say that Jacobi, well, ya that Jacobi murdered him is is definitely an overstatement. But when he uh, when Mendelssohn brought his last uh, um, his last manuscript to the printer, he caught a cold and never recovered. And um, but this was for for Mendelssohn and Jacobi a really existential question, and it's not easy for us in hindsight to understand why the sentence Lessing Lessing sei ein Spinozist gewesen Lessing was a Spinozist why this sentence should be a bombshell, but this is true first and foremost because Spinoza means atheism in the 18th century. So this means that all this talk about deism, natural religion, nature and God, you know, like all these sort of philosophic, the philosophical mysticism is really just a shell and Lessing is an atheist. Meant and Goethe said this explicitly in his autobiography that atheism was the, was the, was the core that was covered um, by by all that nice talk by the great minds in Germany, and this is what what um, Jacobi had blown open, and this is one sense in which this was a controversial statement. But I think there's also a deeper philosophical I mean. Uh, um, level on which this was a controversial statement because for Jacobi, Jacobi's pre, uh, premier most important concern was the, was the controversial, uh, the, sorry, apologies, the confrontation of philosophy and faith of um, reason and revelation. And he chose a conversation with Lessing to bring matters to a head. Um, philosophy, Jacobi argued, was virtually identical with Spinoza. That means setting reason absolute. You know, Spinoza was also the premier rationalist um, for Jacobi. And Jacobi argued that when going through Spinoza, Spinoza, and he had done this very, very carefully, he had studied uh, Spinoza very closely, we can show that philosophy as such leads to nihilism, a word that he invented. Philosophy leads to nihilism because philosophy, according to Jacobi, cannot establish its first principles and therefore cannot ground reason in reason itself but always already relies on an act of what he calls faith or belief, Glaube, same word in German. This, according to Jacobi, means that philosophers, at least those who are consistent in setting reason absolute, have things completely upside down theoretically and practically. Pra I, I add practically because he says they cannot acknowledge human freedom and they cannot acknowledge a personal God. And this, um, this situation that philosophy ends up with, Jacobi describes in a famous image, namely that philosophers have to perform silly headstands and walk on their hands. And for Jacobi, Lessing was clearly the philosopher of his time, right? As we mentioned at the beginning, Kant had not yet published his critique of pure reason. And as soon as... Kant published the critique of uh, re, um, the critique of reason, the first critique. Jacobi would attack Kant as well, and um, he would attack everyone. He was an attack dog. He was the attack dog of the German uh, German philosophical movement. And another fun 
um fun person to read if you wanna uh he's a he's also a great writer um just as Raimaros, the guy I mentioned at the beginning, the author of the unnamed um the unnamed author of the fragments is an amazing author um, and one of the best writers of the German Enlightenment. But at any rate, Jacobi told Lessing, you basically have to uh, perform a constant headstand because you cannot ground your rationalism in reason itself, but have to um, have to hide in, in, in the fact that you're would have to uh, uh, perform an act of faith. And so what Jacobi wants from Lessing, what all ph philosophers should do is perform what he calls a salto mortale. Um, so that uh, is maybe best translated as jump heels overhead. So uh, a, a really dangerous leap of faith um, that would, redress um, the position and allow them to stand on firm ground. And this firm ground is, of course, what Jacobi calls faith and belief. And Lessing, in his conversation with Jacobi, famously refuses uh, to take this leap. Uh, he says this leap would be too much for his uh, old legs and heavy head. And um, I think this is sort of... Uh, a humorous and somewhat ironic um, uh, response, but also gets to something deeper. And um, it, um, this is sometimes called Lessing's ditch. Um, unfortunately, that's a pretty confusing image because it's fused with another quotation from Lessing where he talks about a broad, uh, ugly ditch in a brilliant little essay of his called um, Über den Beweis des Geistes und der Kraft on the proof of spirit and power. And in this essay, he refers to the broad, ugly ditch, which he cannot um, get over. Um, but there it refers to two different kind types of truth. Um, so I would I would keep those separate. But yeah, it's sort of this is what Lessing is famous for. Last I night I, I I posted that then is the ugly great ditch which I cannot cross, however often and however earnestly I have tried to make that leap. So that's what you're talking about. Yes, this is this is the other the other ditch passage, so to speak. Um and there it's more of a logical um point of view. It's it, it there it has more to do with epistemology um and the other the Jacobi ditch has more to do with an existential attitude, I would say. So I try to keep them separate, but in the in 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 the the impact that Lessing had very much blended those two in one. And Kierkegaard um, shows this very. Kierkegaard is the first. Jacobi is is maybe is still a contemporary, but Kierkegaard is the first. Uh, philosophical thinker who engages Lessing after his death and for him it's I mean as you know it's so difficult to know what Kierkegaard um what Kierkegaard's ultimate position was but it is clear from his writings especially from the postscript that um Lessing was one of the most important dialogue partners for uh, for Kierkegaard, yeah. I think I think the the interesting thing that I've learned from the discussion is that you know the Weimar the Weimar circle and the Jena circle, yeah, um, were definitely they were engaged in already what we call today interdisciplinary studies, yes, poetry, art, philosophy, anthropology, sciences, and 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 kind of. There was no division that we have today, yes. like between the sciences and and the humanities. There was very much one ground, and you could work with all of them. You see, Novalis yeah. was flirting with this these ideas using scientific ideas through his poetry. The same yeah. thing with Schelling and Hegel. Yeah, so it it seems that Lessing is is both a modern thinker and already kind of one of the first interdisciplinary 
thinkers yeah. that's experimenting with both, you know, the the literary work of of writing uh, plays, but also philosophical um, core concepts as well too. Yeah. I, I I think that is very well put, and I mean the my, a, a slight correction is that there have been these kinds of thinkers throughout the history of philosophy, right? I mean. Plato is another poet philosopher, I mean, I, I certainly in many respects a greater philosophy poet uh, um, in some respects than Lessing. And uh, Nietzsche, another um, person you've mentioned, is all is a similar. He's hard to place, and he's also like he's poetical and he's philosoph philosophical at the same time. But one thing I would also add is philosophy. Today, we have limited philosophy as a discipline more than the than was typical in the past. So I think one thing we can learn by engaging historically with philosophy, by philosophizing through engaging with the tradition and with the history of philosophy, is one of the key things that we can learn is that there was a broader concept of philosophy than is uh, uh, today often um, uh, held in philosophy departments at universities. And that philosophy had, um, the primary question of philosophy um, was, what is a good life? And this, uh, and, and, and this question um, then led to an, a thoroughgoing, an existential engagement with all those who had different answers, right? That was on the one hand art. I mean, that is that is an old sort of Plato in the Republic refers to the um, old antagonism between poetry and philosophy. What was that about? The minds of young people, or um, we spoke. We've spoken about Lessing and Jacobi in this conversation, and they both engaged um, Christianity and revealed religion as an important um, point of reference, something that we also today often sort of um, push into religious studies uh, departments and or theology departments. But why was that? Why was um, Christianity and revealed religion one of the major subjects for the thinkers we hold in higher regard? Because they had an alternative vision and an alternative uh, answer to the question, what is the good life? And yeah, I mean, I, I don't, yeah, that that's, uh, so I mean, that, that is, um, that is a great point, I think. Yeah. I also think that, um, uh, you know, the, there was a more, there was, in terms of religion, I, I'm speaking here for Schelling and Holderlin, but yeah. this, this, this kind of spiritual pietism that was already prevalent um, in Germany especially within Lutheranism. I, I don't mean the Moravian uh, school yeah. in Halle with Schleiermacher, but I mean this area that, you know, that engaged them in, you know, the exegesis of biblical study, but also the study of philosophy as well, too. And, and there was this very nice kind of blending and of, of both, you know, mystical concepts, but also, so what Franz von Bader the brilliance of him is that he he took theosophical concepts and he and he showed a lot of these thinkers like Holderlin and Schelling. You can take a theosophical idea and make it into a concrete concept. And you yeah. can, there's that kind of gap, that play space between the two of them. Um, and I think this is this is kind of in the air at this time between, um, I, I'm not speaking for Lessing, but I mean, yeah. in general. It, it's no, I, I think you're 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 one hundred percent right. Yeah. And it's, I mean, this is also the interesting point when and we've spoken a little bit about sort of what our field um, regards as a legitimate question right now, right, right now. And for me, this is partly uh, on my mind, because when I, I, when I uh, wrote a, a PhD in philosophy, one of my advisors uh, told me like writing on Lessing is professional suicide. And, um, and on the one hand, I, 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 I do understand that thought, right? But I, I think that we need to remain open to this question and need, we need to see how a field formed itself, 
um, that is a that is an important um, uh, that is an important point, and the air the period about which the two of us happen to be working is particularly fruitful, because this is the moment in time when philosophy, which had typically engaged with re, quote unquote religious or theological questions in the discipline of metaphysics creates a whole new field philosophy of religion right this comes into its own this discipline comes into its own in hegel in the very late berlin lectures uh, 1827 and onwards on the philosoph on the philosophy of religion but this is very clearly on the agenda of kant reinhold schelling the younger hegel and i would also add I would sort of push it back further and would say that Mendelssohn and Lessing also belong to that, um, belong in some respects to um, to that shift in orientation in disciplinary orientation. Um, for in because in Mendelssohn you can sometimes sort of see old dog, what can called dogmatic metaphysics and you can see that sort of theological questions questions about the existence of god and so on uh, and the attributes uh, are discussed in 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 metaphysical writings you can also see in his political philosophy that religion comes into um philosophy becomes attentive to religion in a new way and in lessing i would say that is even more clear and this shift from uh, philosophy engaging with religion and theology within metaphysics to a broader, different, new orientation is something that at the moment is very much on my mind. That's what I my next book hopefully will be about. Yeah, no, um, it's it's definitely it's 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 it's, it's interesting right now that you know. I think that the the whole post structural movement is kind of fading. Yes. And that now, with more interest in in classical German philosophy and German idealism, you know, that it, it's a lot more study is going in. A lot more academics are reworking through some of these concepts, bringing back thinkers like yourself, yeah. you know, writing books on Lessing or or Fichte or. Um, so it's this is very interesting, and and they're very much intertwined. Kind of a philosophy of religion is 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 coming back to the fore it's yeah. no longer a, a faux pas like in in the 80s or 90s oh well, i wasn't <laughs> i wasn't around at that time but in the you know early 2000s yeah. it was you know a faux pas in philosophy yeah. departments actually i'm yeah. i'm actually in a um a humanities department my phd is in humanities and, and i did that on awesome. purpose because my project is a is both philosophical theological and and science studies it's a, a merger of you know what working through 1804 to 1850 is a huge yeah. period within Schelling's work so and you can't just you know yeah anyways um that is brilliant I I, I I I'm I thank you for correcting that but that that is I mean it's it's wonderful that you can do that yeah that's a it's good um I think we've covered all of what we wanted to cover, right? <laughs> With yes. our, our whole, uh, our kind of plan. Um, I want to thank you so much for, for being here, for introducing all of us to Lessing. You were very passionate and, and you went through so many detailed concepts and and you you kind of gave, you you breathed life to, to Lessing for all of us. And um, I want to thank you for being here. And this was, this was great. Thank you very much, Chris. I, I mean, I, I have to thank you for, I mean, I um, lecturing, uh, talking about Lessing nonstop is as most of my, uh, as my family and my friends can tell you, my default mode. So I'm, I'm very happy that you gave me a forum to do that. And thank you so much for, for, um, yeah, for doing this. Wonderful. Well, uh, I like giving, a, a, I like making a space where we can talk about these thinkers. And I am one of those people that, you know, at nighttime, I want to turn on like a YouTube video. I want to hear about both the philosopher's life and their thought. And the, you know, yeah. because our lives also kind of shape how we think about the world as well, too. Yes. Um, and I know when it comes to people like Heidegger, this becomes problematic. 
and a lot of people are doing studies on this now. Yeah. But yeah, no, these are these are themes that interest me, and and I thank you much. Thank you so much for you know entertaining this great conversation and and bringing to life um, lesson. Yeah, you're very welcome, Chris. Thank you. All right, so signing off. Um, I'll I'll talk to you after I hit the the stop button for yes. record. But uh, anyways, thank you for being here, and uh, hope everyone enjoyed the conversation.